Hello, everyone, and welcome to our May Brain Trades Voting Roadmap. We're going to be featuring some exciting speakers today. Uh, we're going to be focusing in on ranked choice voting in the Democratic Party. So if you're curious, our last webinar was about ranked choice voting and uh, the conservative side of the aisle. And this month, we're featuring ranked choice voting and the Democratic Party. Um, we've got a lot of ideas around this vein. So uh, as always, if you have feedback on this webinar, please email us put it in the mobilize feedback uh, survey. And we're happy to hear your ideas for what you want, want to see featured. We're also going to take the next couple months off of webinars because, you know, it's it's a evening in summer. So people don't always come to online events in the summer, but keep an eye out as fall comes along and we'll start up our roadmap series because we know folks have been really loving having these events to count on each month to get a new kind of angle on the ring choice voting movement. But without further ado, I'm going to start off with our agenda here. We'll start with a presentation from Eric Bidstrup, a volunteer uh, who will introduce himself. Then after that, we'll go on to a panel of uh, questions that we've prepared for our panelists. We have right now Carrie Barnes, and we're hoping to have uh, Representative Mia Gregerson here. We'll see. Uh, she's pretty busy, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how that comes along. And then we'll feature your questions. So as always, there's a Q and A section, uh, a Q and A section at the bottom of your of your webinar page, and you can click that, send in your questions, and we might be able to get to that at the end. We can't get to all questions, but if we didn't get to your question, make sure you email us that question so we can get it answered. And then finally, Carrie, our organizer, will uh, Carrie Bull. We have two carries on the call today. Carrie Bull will give a quick uh, update on something you can take action on in Seattle that involves donuts. So let's get this started by passing it over to Eric Bidstrup. Eric, would you like to give us your presentation? Sure, great. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Eric Bidstrup. I'm up here in Edmonds, and I'm the Snohomish County lead for uh, Fair Vote Washington. And while Fair Vote Washington tends to focus, obviously, on Washington State, I wanted to take a few minutes and share. There's a lot of exciting things happening elsewhere across the country as well, and we'll touch on a few of those. Uh, at the federal level, uh, some of you may or may not have heard of the Fair Representation Act uh, that was actually introduced in the 2021 and 2022 congressional sessions. And given that it expired there, uh, we're under our understanding is it's going to be reintroduced this fall. Uh, this act will adopt proportional ranked choice voting for both senators and congressmen. And what's really exciting about this bill is that it requires each state with more than one representative to establish multi-member congressional districts as opposed to the single uh, representative districts that we all uh, know and use to <clears throat> excuse me, today. This is really exciting for a couple of reasons. You know, first and foremost, it uses proportional rank choice voting. What that means is that every congressional district will elect multiple representatives that, you know, reflect, approximately reflect the political preferences in proportional to the population in that particular district. What does that mean? Let's talk about a couple of examples to help illustrate this. Um, start with Tennessee. Tennessee currently has nine congressional representatives. Eight of them are Republicans and one of them is a Democrat. However, if you look down at the breakdown of voters by party across the state, it's approximately 48% Republicans, 36% Democrats, and about 15% independent or swing voters. So for this state, using proportional representation would result in a mix of those nine Congress congressional representatives that better approximates those percentages. Here in Washington, we currently have 10 congressional representatives, eight Democrats, two Republicans. <clears throat> but again, if you go ahead and look down at the breakdown of voters by party, it's approximately uh, by one set of measures of 44 Democrat, 33 Republican, and then 23% swing or independent. Again, proportional representation would help make these uh, percentages better reflect the representation of our government. Uh, another great thing about this bill is one of my favorites. It actually renders gerrymandering irrelevant. Because uh, as an example, what that means is instead of the 10 districts in Washington state that I mentioned earlier, we really only have two congressional districts with five representatives each, each of those districts electing those uh, five representatives using proportional representation. This basically makes the question of where to draw the uh, district boundary lines uh, immaterial. Uh, and then at the state level, uh, there's actually been a lot of uh, ranked choice voting activity going on. 
in 2023 alone, 31 different states have introduced pro-RCV legislation, and most of those are still active at this point in time. The bills cover a lot of different uh, jurisdictions from uh, where ranked choice voting can be applied, everything from presidential primaries to state representatives to local elected positions, you know, down at the city and county level as well. So while the growth of seeing so much pro-ranked uh, choice voting reg uh, legislation is really exciting, Sadly, there's now three more states that have banned ranked choice voting completely, South Dakota, Idaho, and Montana, uh, in addition to Tennessee and Florida that had banned it previously. Although interestingly, during that same set of processes, two states that had attempted to go ahead and ban ranked choice voting actually had those efforts fail, specifically due to governors uh, who vetoed uh, those efforts in North Dakota and Arizona. Uh, I'll go ahead and work with Ben and we'll get a link pasted into the window if you'd like to know more details on your specific state, seeing a breakdown and kind of drill down to brass tacks on specific legislation in specific states, uh, you can go ahead and click through that URL and get that information there. Awesome. I see Ben just uh, put it right into the window there. Perfect. Uh, with that said, that kind of culminates the, the, the look outside of Washington state, kind of both nationally and in other states on that. Uh, ben, I want to go ahead and kick it back to you here. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, and everybody, Eric has volunteered graciously to be around for the Q&A section. So if you've got questions on this, this little nationwide legislation update, drop them in the Q&A and we'll save them for, when, uh, uh, for, for that Q&A. All right. Now we're on to our, our featuring our panelist, Stephanie Houghton. Would you like to take it away? Yes, sure. Hi. Uh, my name is Stephanie Houghton. I'm the managing director at Fairvote Washington. Uh, and I just want to say thank you so much first to Eric. That was illuminating. And it's so nice as someone who spends so much time working on ranked choice voting to know that outside of Washington, we're not alone. Right, like there are people working on this all over the country, um, and appropriate for tonight, uh, we are we've got some blue states that are working on it. We've got some red states. We've got some purple states, all working on ranked choice voting because ranked choice voting is truly a nonpartisan effort. Um, I think if this is not your first roadmap session, uh, you probably know that I come from a Democrat background. Um, and part of the appeal for me is, is actually that I get to talk to everyone. Now I get to not just say like, oh, this person's not on my list, so I'm not interested in having a conversation. So I'm really excited about tonight. But uh, if you didn't get a chance to watch it yet, uh, or if you missed last month's roadmap, I do want to call attention that last month's roadmap was RCV and the GOP, um, which had a great uh, panel uh, and really got into some some really cool issues. So tonight we're talking about Democrats, um, which as I say, I love, but we have talked to Republicans and we work really closely with Republicans. Um, and we also have some uh, a lot of independents or folks who want to be independent um, working on our team as well. Uh, so that's me. Um, tonight we have with us the chair of the King County Democrats, uh, Carrie Barnes. Sorry, I lost her for just a second. Uh, welcome, Carrie. Uh, and hopefully Representative Gregerson will join us shortly. Um, I know we we're having a couple of difficulties, but um, if not, Carrie and I will carry on. And Carrie, <laughs> give you a chance to just introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and giving me the space to be here with you. I am the current chair of the King County Democrats, and it is amazing. King County has 17 legislative districts, and one of those legislative districts is the 37th legislative district, which is the one from Mount, uh, Mount Baker all the way to Skyway. And that is where I live in South Seattle and where I got my start into political party work. Uh, my last job was, I should say job, um, my last volunteer organizer role was chair of the 37th legislative district. And I just am having a lot of fun. It's It's been amazing. So thank you. Well, we are very happy that you are here. Um, my first question, actually, you, you just touched on this, was talking about legislative districts. And I just want to make sure that everybody on the call, this was new to me when I moved to Washington. So if you can just do a quick primer on how is this party set up in, in the state of Washington? 
Okay. It's, it's a, it's one of those that it, it was new to me too. And the, the county, I'm going to start at the state. So we've got Washington state, which has 49 counties. And then in a county, you have legislative districts and it's based on population. And in King County, we have 17 different legislative districts and our legislative districts are made up of precincts and that's where you live. And usually there are about 325 um, households. And we've got what are called in the Democratic Party and same with Republican Party. Um, we have precinct committee officers. And I was, what is an officer? Why would you say precinct committee officer? And the reason that you own a precinct in your neighborhood as a precinct committee officer is that you're really an organizer. You talk to all your neighbors. And the officer part is because you, as a PCO, it's another term you'll hear, have a vote in party leadership. That's why you're an officer. The exciting thing also about precinct committee officers is that if there's a vacancy from a state legislature, um, from a, legis from a um, representative or a senator at the state level, they, the PCOs, vote on the appointment. An example is in the 37th and 2016 uh, um, U.S. Um, Congresswoman from Al Jayapal won her election. She went from a state senator to the federal to the U.S. And the PCOs of the 37th voted on her replacement. And that is how we got the amazing Rebecca Saldana, Senator Rebecca Saldana. That's awesome. That's really helpful context. That's, that's the officer, yeah. So I'm sure there's lots more questions, but that's a very high overview. We appreciate it. And that's a good reminder, everyone, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see two little uh, Q&A little boxes. Um, we're gonna have time for Q&A uh, at the end. Uh, like Ben said, we might not get to everyone's question, but please do feel free to throw your questions in there as, as you think of them. Uh, and we've got a team on the back end who's working on the questions and then we'll, we'll throw them over to me once, um, once it's that time. Um, so, Ranked choice voting question now. Um, how did you first hear about ranked choice voting uh, and how did you come to support it? So perfect. As I said, when I was chair of the 37th legislative district, we were looking for a way. So every year, a legislative district in the county, you have candidates, Democratic candidates that come through for endorsements. So the candidates compete for the endorsement of the legislative districts. And we were looking for a way that we could have our vote that was um, really inclusive, transparent, and really met the moment. We were looking at different, um, we had some really great proponents of ranked choice voting. And one of the things about with, um, with our folks is that folks didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. But the more um, it was explained, the more we understood, it took a lot of practice, a lot of explaining, and we voted as a membership. It took about maybe two to three months. Um, and we use it now, and the 37th still does, for all of our endorsed candidates. And it's two times a year, usually in May and June and in September. So when we put our um, our endorsement out, we're using ranked choice voting. That's great. That's awesome. Um, and I, I will also point out that um, I believe your district started doing it before we had the ability to sort of send out, this is a piece of technology you can use for ranked choice voting. So now we have that. So if you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to use ranked choice voting for my group, please let us know. We will help you. Carrie will have more on that. Uh, Sorry, Carrie Bull, our organizer, will have more on that later. Um, uh, the Democratic Party in Washington has previously added ranked choice voting to their party platform. Why do you think Democrats tend to be supportive of this election reform? It, I think two reasons. One, it is a way that as voters, as a member, how, and I'm using it off of personal experience, that you feel 
included. There, it is a way that you've got several qualified candidates and it's a way that you can get a majority of folks behind a candidate through ranked choice voting. There's options for voting and I'm, I'm hope, you know, there, there could be five candidates. You can vote for all five or one or two or three. It is a way that you feel um, one candidate may be really strong in one area, one candidate um, has a different strength, but as Democrats, we're, we're really looking at being inclusive, being a, you know, having these candidates that meet our values and ranked choice voting really distills that down in a way that you're, you're able to really use your voice where you feel seen and heard. I think that's really important, even like within the party. Um, I know you and I have talked about before, sometimes these uh, primaries or looking for endorsement or folks who are looking for endorsements, like those can get to be some pretty nasty fights. Right. Um, so I, yeah, I think that, that totally, totally makes sense. And I think um, if I can just add to your point oh, is that one of the, with ranked choice voting, you've got, and I'm just going to use five as an easy number, five candidates, and it's not an all or nothing. So you have, you are having to really um, put yourself out there, not in total opposition where you would turn someone off, but more um, broader because you may want that second. We've in, in our endorsement process, we run it through um, first choice, second choice several times in order to get um, either a two thirds or a majority. But what that means is as, as candidates, you, you're not going all out in opposition to each other because you got to get, you, you know, you want your second and third, you want a majority of folks to also pick you. And I just think it's a broader appeal to human beings who really just want to um, to vote for you. Yeah, that's so true. Something that we say a lot in, in the ranked choice voting movement is that you get to vote with your whole voice. You don't just have to limit your voice to this one particular um, candidate. Uh, so as you know, I think, uh, Carrie, we worked this year, uh, Fairvote Washington worked on a piece of legislation for using ranked choice voting in presidential primaries. Um, it's the only primary, I believe, um, that is partisan here in Washington. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background. Um, so in, uh, in the 2020 Democratic pr presidential primary, 25% of voters mailed in their ballot for a candidate who dropped out before primary day. Uh, we've been working with the legislature to pass the ranked choice voting for presidential primaries bill. Can you tell us what you've been hearing about this bill and why you think it's important? So I think it is so important. I think using 2020 as an example, that um, you are able again to have your voice heard and you you don't feel like you're throwing away a vote. And I have a personal experience um, because throughout the 2020, we had all we had several Democratic candidates and I was really um, invested in the campaign for Pete Buttigieg. And when the ballots came out, I filled out my bubble. Two things, I did not really invest into the other candidates because it was a silo. I had one vote, one primary. It felt like there were different camps. I would have liked to. I would have liked to have said, you know, Warren's economic policy, Bernie's, it, it it just really put me in a in a a single situation because I was all in for Pete. What happened is he dropped out of the race, so my vote ended right there. I was sad, of course, the whole you know the whole campaign ended. But imagine if I had been able to then pick uh, maybe Warren and then Biden. I still would be included and involved, and it just makes sense that we can get around a majority candidate by using ranked choice voting. Yeah, and I yeah, twenty five percent of voters uh, being told 
you know, that actually, it didn't count this time. It was we weren't able to count it. The votes were counted. There's nothing nefarious happening, but, but they can't be counted towards a candidate because that candidate is no longer running. And ranked choice voting is, to me, a very clear solution to that problem. Um, I also know uh, that in, in my experience working on that Democratic primary, um, like you said, it, like you said, it's it can be very siloed. It can also mean that there there are some tears in the party because you feel like you have to pick one side or another, and it doesn't enable you to build the party because you have to keep to your your own uh, silo. So I don't know if you had any experience with that side of it, um, or if it was really just I have to put my head down and just do this one thing right now. You know, it, it, it both, I think aspirationally, um, it makes sense as a party not to be so siloed because we get invested, we get emotional, we, we, we identify with a candidate and what we want to do is really broaden that to, to have that, um, identifying piece with more, um, of the party. So Democrats across a whole could benefit by not being so siloed into this one. And that's human nature. Um, and from a party, it's, you know, you, you get siloed and then you all come back together. But it would be great if we're all together all the time because we want a Democrat to win. They meet our values. Um, the the policy that they are promoting will help the most human beings. It may not be my policy, but it's still a Democrat policy. And it is a way for really the intent of people having that representation for who they are and their values. Um, have, there been, have there been any lessons that you've learned the hard way? about ranked choice voting? I think the, the hardest lesson um, is time and explanation and more information is more. There can never be enough practice, enough information. You know, we had with our, um, with our legislative district, we went, we had um, folks who was used, they were very, and I was sharing, they were very used to paper ballots. So we took them from paper ballots to um, a COVID Zoom voting, which um, is tough, to ranked choice voting, and taking you know that that's a it's a it's a big step, but we practiced. We had um, you know we did ice cream, we did dogs, we did neighbors. We just kept we kept at it, and I would say the fear of the unknown, um, what is this, was once um, the practices happened and then we did a real vote, it was, it people, and I, I've shared this, you could see the data, you could see how, um, how we ran it all the way through and people were happy. Yeah. And it, it made a big difference going too fast without explanation. I think you guys do a great job because you have all this literature, you have all these examples. You know, we didn't have that at that time. It was, you know, we were kind of, um, you know, putting PowerPoints together. But now I just feel the education is out there and it's really, it's spectacular. So that's, I really, really appreciate what you just said because it's it's true that it, sometimes it feels, and this goes back to what Eric was talking about earlier too, right? Like there are places doing this all over the country and we get to learn from one another. You know, this worked really well in New York City. There was a cross endorsement in New York City. Candidates actually saying, vote for me first, vote for this guy second though, which was really cool to see. And, um, you know, seeing that really intense voter education over in New York. Um, and then there are, put, there are other so many places across the country that have sort of done it their own way. And for me, one of the reasons I really like thinking about that here in Washington is that Washington, and I've worked in a dozen states, I've worked in so many states, and Washington leads the way 
every time on voter turnout and voter education. Like, what a cool opportunity we have with everybody gets a voter pamphlet, right? Like, wow, right. that's cool. Maybe we could use that to educate people about ranked choice voting. It just seems like such a perfect setup um, here in Washington for that. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So this is what I'm going to do next. Um, thank you so much. Those are amazing. Um, I'm not getting enough, getting enough questions yet. So keep adding those questions in panel, um, for Carrie or for Eric. Um, I'm actually going to make this very confusing now and invite Carrie Bull to join us. <laughs> she can bring an organizer perspective. Um, she also has a lot of experience working and volunteering for uh, Democratic candidates. Um, and actually, she was just telling us before we got started about her experience in the 2020 Democratic primary and voting, um, or rather not voting, but choosing a candidate. So Carrie, I'm gonna pull you in and then we're switching over to Q&A and audience, I'm relying on you. So come up with some good ones. Good. Well, super excited to be pulled in. I could, I really love ranked choice voting and I, um, this job was such an easy yes to jump into. Um, my exposure to ranked choice voting as some of you on this call might know was actually back in 2017. I, um, received my undergraduate education at the University of Minnesota. And my first campaign that I was paid to work on was former city councilman, Philippe Cunningham. And together using ranked choice voting, we um, were able to bring this really strong community power and elect the first transgender man to a city council anywhere in the United States, which was a really exciting moment for me. Um, we unseated a woman who had had her seat for 20 years and her mother had had it for the 30 years prior. So it was like this dynasty. And it was really, um, I think, a, an exciting moment for that neighborhood to reclaim their voice. And I think that's also exactly a little bit of what parties can get afraid of, is that these like young whippersnapper candidates are going to come in and take these seats. Um, and at the same time, that's it was more democratic and this candidate received the majority of the votes, not just the plurality. And so um, community really had their strong voice. So I've been, my political career started in 2016. <laughs> so it's been a wild ride, but um, I've said yes to ranked choice voting ever since. And I'm really excited to be here. So yeah. well, we're very excited that you're here too, Carrie. Okay. so. Um, I am going to try to run a panel with two people named Carrie. So please be patient with me while we work through this. Um, uh, first question from the audience. Uh, like I was talking about the 2024 presidential primary, um, uh, pre presidential primary bill. 2024 is, unfortunately, it is too late. We cannot implement it for 2024. Um, we've got to actually like, print the ballots. So like we're, we're quite literally running out of time. Um, but what do you do, and I'll, I'll put this to both of you, um, think, do you think it's likely that the presidential primary uh, in 2028 for Democrats will use ranked choice voting here in Washington? For context, other states already use it. Um, so here in Washington, do you think we'll get there? Wait, who should, which Carrie should go first? Oh, Carrie Barnes, you've got the green square around you. You go first. <laughs> Carrie Bees. I think yes. And it. I'm hoping. Um, and the reason is both as a Democratic Party and as how we vote and how we elect our representatives, it's an evolution. I look at as my son is um, going to college, SATs are no longer the benchmark. And I am a little like my brain is like, how can there not be SATs anymore? But it's just progress. It's just the evolution of um, the best way to go about really both choosing, electing, evaluating the best candidate. So I both I think, yes, I will um, put my name um, on the horse on the horse race that it will and it will um, within Washington state, I, I feel like we have it. So. Great. Carrie Ball, what do you think? 
I think, yeah, absolutely. And I'm really excited for Washington to be one of the states that implements it because it's to pile onto what Carrie Barnes said, like we are a progressive state. This is a progressive um, and necessary democratic reform that we need. And Washington is, I think, a quiet leader. I think a lot of people don't really know how important our legislation is nationally. And I'm really excited for us to be a leader this way. Um, Right. Yeah. Cool. Me too. <laughs> um, uh, so another question, um, and I'm, I'm reading these from another screen, so pardon, pardon me, but um, recently a Democrat friend in Skagit County commented that she understood that the Washington State Democratic Party would not accept results of a ranked choice voting party. Uh, this is old and fake information. Um, and I'm actually just going to take this one because I answer it all the time. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, five other states used ranked choice voting to submit their nomination for president in 2020. Uh, those were um, party run um, primaries, not state run. And here in Washington, we have state run primaries. Um, this year, we think and hope that Maine will be uh, doing a state run ranked choice voting presidential part primary. And by this year, I'm so sorry, I mean 2024. We're not doing anything this year. Um, uh, and that that will actually mean that, you know, states like Washington feel like they have uh, the ability to, to start using it as well. Um, so that is something that we've heard. I do not dismiss it because I don't want anyone to feel like I'm saying they're that these votes don't matter, or that they don't count. Um, but we think that uh, the Washington State Democratic Party uh, is allowed to do this and, and will, you know, like Carrie was talking, Carrie Barnes was talking about lots of education um, and also seeing how it goes. Let's see how it goes in these other states. Um, okay, the questions are flying in. This is great. Y'all are great. Thank you so much. Um, do, 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 do. sorry, I have, to, I have to scroll up to the questions now, excuse me. Um, um, in, uh, this is a question from Chris Mason. Uh, what can folks from different legislative districts do to support ranked choice voting within the Washington Democratic Party? Great question. Carrie Barnes. I would say adopt it as a method for your endorsement, for adopting your resolutions in your legislative district and take your Washington state committee members who um, are on your executive board, who go to the state, tell them exactly how great it is. It is one of those, when we had um, in our legislative district, after we had our, um, our meeting and we would show ranked choice, people were, people were happy. And by being able to tell that to the state party, that is exactly what you can do. Adopt it, practice, promote it, and send it to the state. Right, yeah. Um, we have fun ways for people to use it uh, as well outside of their legislative districts. Carrie Bull, we'll talk about that momentarily, but yes. One of the things that we know out of New York City, out of Alaska, out of Maine, is that once people start using ranked choice voting, I'm so sorry, um, it's okay. um, that once people start using ranked choice voting, they want to keep using ranked choice voting. Um, so if that starts at your legislative district, that's incredible. That's great. Um, and Fair Vote Washington, we are happy to come help help implement that. Carrie Barnes, go ahead. And I was just going to say the legislative district, it's just a um, once you adopt, well, usually members vote on a rules change. And it is both bring in Fair Vote Washington. They will um, just help implement all of the um, all the language that folks need to feel comfortable in practice. Yes. And, and just to be really clear, we want everyone to practice. So I know that we've got a lot of Democrats on our call tonight. If you are a Republican or if you are a member of another party uh, that has a nominating contest or if your book club has a nominating contest, please let us know because we would love to, truly we would love to come in and talk about how to do this. Um, 
And once, and again, once people start using it, they want to keep using it because they see, they can literally see how it works and how they're like, oh, my vote went here now because that was my second choice. Um, I, um, I, I want to pile on a little bit to what Carrie said, because a lot of us um, on this call or a lot of people on this call are Democrats, um, but maybe not everybody is involved with their legislative district. And if that's not, if that's the case for you, um, Carrie Barnes is completely right. Reach out to us. We would be more than happy to help connect you to your legislative district, um, connect you to the people in power in those legislative districts who are making those decisions or who help implement these votes. Um, we're here to help, absolutely. Me in particular. Uh, <laughs> uh, a question from Catherine. Uh, what kind of pushback was common when encouraging Democrats to use ranked choice voting in uh in your context i think i think carrie barnes um uh and how did it still end up being adopted so how did you persuade persuade folks i think there were um the initial pushback was it's too confusing will it make sense and will will um it, it's kind of a will will it make sense will Will there be a, a power, you know, with one candidate versus several? Um, and they're all valid, all real concerns. What really changed was, and I'm going to say it again, was just the example and practice of what it really is. If you, and we did, um, again, some of our members were, um, a little bit older, some were really young, some were used to technology, but when they saw that you could like chocolate ice cream, vanilla and strawberry, but you could just like chocolate, call it good. You could like chocolate and vanilla, or you liked all three. When we could show what that looked like at the end, it, it just made sense. And it felt, um, the feeling was, I get it. But overcoming the initial um, pushback is really, um, I would say it was more of a, a an experiential practice in order to overcome that. And then it was really, I, I mean, I don't want to use the word easy because nothing's really easy, but it was smooth. It, it really was. Um, and those are just some common pushbacks. It's, it's almost an unknown at first, and it looks complicated because there's more than one bubble to fill out. But then once the education comes in that you don't, it's not just one, you can have two, because we all, that's just kind of as human beings, it's kind of our preferences anyways. Um, so it just, it was very, it ended up to be quite natural. Yeah, for me, when I'm trying to, when I'm talking to my Democrat friends about it too, I do talk about the 2020 presidential a lot and say there were 23 candidates. No one was gonna get 50% right? Like that, that's wild. 50% on the first round. So what do you do then? You just say, okay, well, this candidate who got, you know, 20%, they win. They have now won. The, they are now the one who is going to represent all of these other voters. And, and that's an extreme case. We don't often see cases with that many candidates, but the promise of ranked choice voting is that if and when that happens, if and when people run, because we're asking people to run who don't traditionally run, that they have a shot now. Um, so I think that's also something that has appealed to a lot of Democrats that I've talked to and a lot of not Democrats that I've talked to um, as well. Uh, Carrie, do you have anything? Uh, Carrie Bull, is there anything that you wanna add to that? Not at the moment, thank you. <laughs> Um, I do. Um, I do want to lift up a question from uh, Richard asking: Do we plan to do a Zoom meeting with independents, non-aligned, and third-party devotees to give their ideas if they are hearing on ranked choice voting? Of course, yes, yes. Um, so we did a Republican-focused uh, Zoom. We're doing a Democrat-focused Zoom. Third party is absolutely um, on deck. Um, like Ben said. <laughs> attendance has gone down since the since the evenings have gotten lighter and lighter so we're going to wait until um the summer has cooled off a little bit but absolutely yes and i will point out that uh we have a lot of allies um and we've got board members 
um, who are third party uh, members and leadership in, in those teams. Um, so absolutely, yes. Uh, that is not something that we have forgotten or something that we take for granted. Um, a great suggestion and yes, part of our plan. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, question from Scott. How do you see the coming use of ranked choice voting in Seattle as changing the attitudes statewide? Uh, Carrie Bull, do you want to take that one to start? Oh, Carrie. Okay, am I am freezing? I think it's me. Can you hear me okay? Do you want me to take that one? Go for it. So I think um, if I if I heard the question right, how how do we see the coming use of ranked choice voting in Seattle changing the attitude statewide? I think in Seattle, an example that we can use right now, just and it's a local race, total local races, but we have got 45 candidates running for seven city council races. And it reminds me of 2021 when we had a lot of mayor candidates. So what that means is that you as a voter really get to engage in every one of these candidates. As Seattle is leveraging this tool and adopting, we want it statewide. But I think with anything, as long as people can see it in practice, then it, it will, um, how to explain it? It's, it, it, it's almost that, it, there's no fear then someone else is trying it because it's working over here. But I just think a, a prime example is, you know, we've got city council races where there are 10 people running um, per race and really finding the best candidate with the majority of that candidate, instead of just saying, I'm only voting for one. Well, you still can do, you could still vote for one, but you could vote, you can rank them all 10, you could go eight, three, it's really a way to invest yourself into learning about these candidates and having the candidates also not um, broaden their base. You know, they don't get stuck in their base as well. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Carrie Bull, do you have anything you want to add about how Seattle might affect the statewide attitudes toward ranked choice voting? Absolutely. I think I definitely agree with Carrie. I hope that Carrie Barnes that I hope that um when people see it, they have a little more confidence in it. And I'm really excited to see the way ranked choice voting impacts the policy in Seattle. I think people have strong opinions about Seattle across the state, good or across the state, good or bad. And so I'm really curious as someone who lives in Seattle, but somebody who has worked all over the state to see how people are going to say, well, like this brought about this change and see that direct connection. And I have a lot of hope that we're going to see positive change for that reason, um, because everybody who makes it through the primary, um, as soon as we do implement it, hopefully, which will be 2025, um, by 2027 as the late at the latest, I'm excited to see how that positively impacts our legislation and how people view our city. Yeah, I think that's that's really, really going to be important. Um, I'm I'm also really excited to see how it affects uh, attitudes across the state. Um, but also, like we're not going to wait. We're working on uh, we're going to keep working on a residential primaries bill. Um, we are also working on a local options bill, which would allow cities like Seattle um, and other local jurisdictions to start using ranked choice voting all the way through to the general. Right now. Um, statewide statute requires that they have a top two primary. Um, and our local options bill would just say, you don't have to have a top two primary anymore. You're able to use ranked choice voting right on through. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm so sorry, I lost the question. Um, Carrie Burns, what is your perspective on how can how can Fairville Washington get more Democratic Party leadership in Washington to support ranked choice voting on statewide legislation like the President's Primaries Bill, but also like this local options bill? 
I, um, it's a really good question. I think it is, sometimes it's, it's again, from a party structure, it is getting from a legislative district to a county, to the state. And in each legislative district, you have one Senator and two representatives. And you also have a congressional um, candidate who just oversees the area. They all have influence. They all have a voice. And it's also a way that for fair vote, for bring choice voting, it is um, a proof point that it works. So it's, I'm gonna use the 37th as an example. Our state senator, uh, Rebecca Saldana, and our two, um, both Chapala Street and Sharon Tomiko Santos, they've, it's getting more folks who are familiar with it. So that is not this, um, it, it's an education in practice. And I think using your voice, I think organizing, I think door knocking, I think getting out to voters. I think if um, Fair Vote Washington is saying we, um, the activity and the organizing behind it at the state, make sure that your voice is heard on the, for the folks who are making the decision. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, we're coming up. You got, you have all answered the call. We are coming up on the last couple of questions. Um, question from Anne. I think the big argument for ranked choice voting is that it's actually more democratic with a small d by encouraging more candidates without splitting the vote in a way that disadvantages any party. Can you comment on that argument? Carrie Barnes. So it is absolutely true. When you have um, you the access to elected office, a lot of times is determined by finances. So either, you know, if there's, um, you allow more people to have the opportunity to be included in the process without it being a one vote, which sometimes can be the one who has the, um, the most mailings, the most TV, the the one who's probably has the most financial backing, would they be the best representative for an election? The answer could be no, but people feel that they only have one vote. But if you were able to have seven, and I usually use five, but for some reason I'm using seven candidates, then you, you're you really basing it on value. You're not, you're not saying only this one can win as we get into our, you know, we've got one Democrat, you, you are able to see it across the board and it, it allows more access. It allows voters to have more choices. And it really takes a hard look as a candidate for who I am appealing to. It needs to be broader. I can't just depend on um, a 30% because it's going to be split everywhere else. You need to really broaden your what you are going to do for the voters. And so I, I'm in full agreement. It's a long-winded way to say yes. Carrie Ball? Honestly, the answers just go on forever. Like this is like the crux of why ranked choice voting is so exciting. So I just also wanna add that when you can break your votes and you won't have worry of splitting the vote, you can vote for whoever you want to with your heart. You don't have to play political pundit. You don't have to say, oh, this candidate is not viable. They're viable. They're on the ballot. You can vote for them. And it really gets to be that simple instead of saying, oh, well, I really want, um, you know, so-and-so to win, but I'm really worried about this opponent. So I'm going to vote for this third person because I think they have a better chance. You don't have to do that anymore. You can actually vote for who you want to. So I think that's a really exciting part of this. I also think it really gets rid of the whole wait your turn sort of mentality with running for office. Um, we have this sort of like bench mentality, like you have to sit on the bench and you have to wait your turn and you don't get to run when you're ready. Like you have to wait until somebody else says go. And so it really creates a more fertile, rich, political ground in which to grow from instead of 
such a competition and um, elitist mentality. So absolutely encourages um, democracy, big D democracy. <laughs> it is very much democratic. So thank you for this question, Ian. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I think a quick question for Carrie Barnes. Um, has the text of the ranked choice voting or RCV rules used in LD37 been distributed to the other legislative districts? They are available. I don't know that they've been distributed. It's a really good question. Um, we did a, a road show of training to the different oh. LD uh, two years ago, but leadership um, has reorg, so new leadership. So it's a really good point as a county chair. I should probably get those into more hands. So it's a really great, um, great, great reminder. Yeah, let us know if we can be helpful. Cause like you said, like sometimes talking it through and doing some demonstrations really helps. So we would love to help you with that. And I'll take um, you up and yeah. Uh, and I'm gonna say this is the last question for the evening. Um, are there candidates in the upcoming primary that support ranked choice voting that we can get behind? Carrie Bull, do you wanna share this answer with me? Oh my gosh, wait, which upcoming race? <laughs> I mean, no, the upcoming primaries, we're doing our candidate survey right now. That is true. Um, no, I'm not ready to comment on this. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to take it. Um, so Fairville Washington every year does a questionnaire for all of the candidates uh, and that are running. Um, there are literally thousands of them. There are so many. Um, but we have a process this year. We've got a pretty a short questionnaire that we sent out to all of the candidates, um, and it's pretty straightforward. Our priority is um, proportional ranked choice voting. Our priority is making sure that more candidates know about it. The candidates have to be educated too. Um, running in a ranked choice voting race is going to be a new experience for some of these folks. Um, so what we do is we get all the questionnaires, we do a couple of interviews, uh, and then folks are gonna, then we're going to to announce sort of uh, if who we are supporting um, and at what level they are supporting. Because like we've already talked about tonight, we've talked about a couple different ways that ranked choice voting can be used. The presidential primary, the local options bill. Some people really like one, don't like the other. Some people love it all. Um, and so we want to indicate that to all of you, our supporters. We will post it on our website the candidates who want some love from us will also probably share it on their website. Um, but we will uh, be emailing out our candidate guide before primary, uh, before primary day so that you can see if you're having trouble deciding, um, like, oh, well, this person really, this person got an A from uh, Fairville, Washington, this person got a B. Um, and we, we, we love all of our uh, ranked choice voting supporters, but the level of support really, really does matter. So um, really good question. Uh, and that's what we have been doing and we will continue to do. It is a process, so please be patient. Um, and if there is a candidate that you think really ought to fill this out, um, we are going to have our questionnaire just on our website. So everyone was sent a, a questionnaire. Um, we did not skip anyone, um, but we have gotten word that some have gone to junk mail and we know that some folks, you know, get inundated with these questionnaires. So if you've got a candidate that you really want to fill it out, um, send them to our website. It should be up uh, in the next couple of days um, and or just feel free to reach out to us and say, can I have a copy of the questionnaire and we'll we'll send it over to you. Um, so that's my last thing. Um, Carrie Barnes, I will ask you for a closing comment and then I will ask Carrie Bull to close us out all together because I know she has a fun announcement too. I just want to say thank you. I am just a in an in practice a huge fan of ranked choice voting. And I think my own experience with the presidential primary that Washington state, we can lead on this. We can really lead with getting this implemented. Other states are doing it. I would love to see you succeed. And I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. Carrie Ball, close us out. All right. Well, thank you, Carrie B. 
Um, I am really excited to talk about another way that we are spreading awareness um, for ranked choice voting. Um, as I'm sure everyone on this call is aware, we passed ranked choice voting for Seattle's local primaries to be used as early as 2025 and by 2027. But we think that since the voters approved it, why not just get this going? And so we're really excited to help educate Seattleites um, and especially donut lovers. Um, we have partnered with five donut shops across Seattle, um, and we encourage all of you to go to these five donut shops and rank your favorites. Um, it's an opportunity to practice ranked choice voting in a very sweet way. Um, our donut shops are Fuji Bakery, um, Dose Donuts, we have King Donuts, The Donut Factory, and Dough Joy. And they are all spread out across North Seattle to West Seattle to South Seattle. So I hope there's a shop near you. And as you participate, and as you know, if you can only rank one, still go ahead and rank it. Um, the poll will close this Friday, right around noon. This Friday is National Donut Day. So we encourage you to get out and get your sweet treat and have a time and celebrate this profound national holiday. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much for everything you do. Um, and if there's an, a similar event in your industry or your neighborhood that you'd like to um, see happen, if you want to bring coffee shops in your neighborhood or anything like that, please reach out. This is a really fun event. People are having a lot of fun doing it. Over a thousand people have voted in this poll so far. So really accessible as well. Great. Well, thanks you all so much. Have a great summer. See you Thank later. You. Bye.